Mr. President, until the pandemic, she was here every Sunday sitting in that seat. Can you imagine how intimidating it is to stand here and preach with Martin Luther King Jr.'s sister? <laughs> you get to do that this morning. <laughs> we are honored to introduce this morning a man who really needs no introduction. But let me just say that I am inspired by his lifelong commitment to service. Having gone to the Senate, at age 29, representing the great state of Delaware for 36 years, and while in the Senate, <laughs> while in the Senate, working on too many bills and too many initiatives to name, but some of the things that come to mind are his work on the Judiciary Committee with the Landmark Legislation of Violence Against Women Act. <laughs> it strengthens penalties for violence against women and creates resources for survivors of assault his work on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, 12 years shaping American policy. But here's what he says. He says, America is an idea. America is an idea. An idea that is stronger than any army, bigger than any ocean, more powerful than any dictator or tyrant. It gives hope to the most desperate people on earth. It guarantees that everyone is treated with dignity and gives hate no safe harbor. It instills in every person in this country the belief that no matter where you start in life, there's nothing you can't achieve if you work at it. That's what we believe. That is what we believe, but it is also the reason we come each year to lift up Martin Luther King Jr. and so many others. Because Langston Hughes perhaps said it best, that America, is the land that both is and is to come. We are pushing towards those ideals. And so we are inspired by his life of service. We are also inspired by the way in which he has transformed his pain into power. Joe Biden is no stranger to suffering and to grief, but his faith has sustained him through it all. He is a devout Catholic. This Baptist service might be a little bit rambunctious and animated. <laughs> but I saw him over there clapping his hands. We're so glad that you're here. Many have come to the pulpit of Ebenezer Church. We've had presidents before. President Jimmy Carter has stood in this pulpit. President George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama. But this is the first president, the first sitting president to deliver the sermon on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Mr. President, the choir's going to warm it up for you. <laughs> That's how we Baptists do. And then the next voice you will hear is that of the 46th President of the United States, Joe Biden.
Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major. Say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. That's all I want to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word of song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can help somebody as I pass, And cheer somebody with a word or song. If I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living. Shall not be in vain. If I can point somebody to the lamb once slain, if I can turn.
Can you all hear me? Yo. I've spoken before parliaments, kings, queens, leaders of the world. I've been doing this for a long time. But this is intimidating following. You all are incredible. I, uh, And let's lay one thing to rest. I may be a practicing Catholic. We used to go to 7.30 Mass every morning in high school and then in college before I went to the black church. <laughs> Not a joke. Andy knows this. Andy, it's so great to see you, man. You're one of the greatest we've ever had. You really are, Andy. Andy and I took on apartheid in South Africa and a whole lot else. They didn't want to see him coming. But... Uh, we used to, uh, that's where we'd organize, to march or to segregate the city. My state was, like yours, segregated by law. We were a slave state, to our great shame. And uh, we had a lot of leftovers of the bad things come from that t period of time. But uh, I, uh, anyway, that's another time. <laughs> but I learned a lot. And I promise if any preacher preached to me back then, I'm not going to be nearly as long as you were. actually have a bad reputation for speaking too long. He followed the path of Moses, a leader of inspiration, calling on the people not to be afraid. And always, always, as my grandfather would say, keep the faith. He followed the path of Joseph, a believer in dreams and the divinity they carry and the promise they hold. And like John the Baptist, he prepared us for the greater hope ahead, one who came to bear witness to the light. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a nonviolent warrior for justice who followed the word and the way of his Lord and his Savior. On this day of remembrance, we gather at Dr. King's cherished Ebenezer. I say, emphasize the word cherished Ebenezer. And by the way, sis, every good man, every good brother needs a really strong, strong sister. You think I'm kidding? I'm no Dr. King, and my sister's not you, but I tell you what. She's smarter, better looking, and a better person than I am. <laughs> Managed all my campaigns. Folks, you know, uh, on this day of remembrance, as we gather here at his cherished Ebenezer, to commemorate what would have been Dr. King's 94th birthday, we gather to contemplate his moral vision and to commit ourselves to his path, to his path the path that leads to the beloved community, to the sacred place, that sacred hour when justice rains down like waters and righteousness is a mighty stream. Folks, to the King family, I know no matter how many years pass, it doesn't matter how many years pass, those days of remembrance are difficult. They bring everything back as if it happened yesterday. It's hard for you. I don't want to thank the King family, presumptuous of me to do this, but on behalf of the whole congregation, for being willing to do this year in and year out, because you give so much, so much to the rest of us. And we love you all. We love you all. To fully honor Dr. King, we have to pay tribute to Mrs. Coretta Scott King, who we dearly miss. She led the movement that created the King holiday and so much more. In my view, this is her day as well. And to Raphael Warnock, Reverend, Doctor, Senator,
Congratulations on your historic victory. A fellow Morehouse man. I've come to know a lot of Morehouse men. That old saying, you, you can't tell them much. <laughs> but I tell you what, we've set up for the first time ever in the White House the Divine Nine Committee. It's active every day. <laughs> and I watch how the other graduates pick on the Morehouse men. You stand in Dr. King's pulpit, and you carry on his purpose. And this service doesn't stop at the church door. It didn't with Dr. King, it doesn't with you, and it doesn't with the vast majority of you standing sitting before me. I want to thank you for the honor of inviting me to be called to America's, America's Freedom Church. And thank you to this congregation and to all the distinguished guests, elected and unelected officials that are here today, who've done so much over so many years, and so many young people are going to do so much more than we were ever able to do. What's your name, honey? Well, it's good to see you. Maybe I can have a picture with you when I, before I leave, okay? Is that all right? I say this with all sincerity. I stand here humbled, being the first sitting president of the United States to have an opportunity to speak at Ebenezer Sunday service. You've been around for 136 years. I know I look like it, but I haven't. <laughs> I'm God-fearing, thanks to my parents and to the nuns and priests who taught me in school. But I, I am no preacher. But I've tried to walk my faith as all of you have. I stand here inspired by the preacher who is one of my only political heroes. I've been saying, and Andy's heard me say it for years, I have two political heroes my entire life when I started off as a 22-year-old kid in the East Side of the Civil Rights Movement and got elected to the United States Senate when I was 29. I wasn't old enough to take office. And I have two heroes. Bobby Kennedy, I admired John Kennedy, but I could never picture him at my kitchen table. But I could Bobby, and no malarkey, Dr. King, Dr. King. And uh, the fact is that, uh, you know, I stand here at a critical juncture for the United States and the world, in my view. We're at what I've, some of my colleagues are tired of hearing me saying, but we're at what we call an inflection point. One of those points in world history where what happens the last few years and will happen in the next six or eight years is going to determine what the world looks like for the next 30 to 40 years. It happened after World War II. It's happening again. The world is changing. There's much at stake. Much at stake. And you know, the fact is that this is the time of choosing. This is the time of choosing, direct choices we have. Are we a people who will choose democracy over autocracy? Couldn't ask that question 15 years ago. We thought democracy was settled, not for African Americans. But democracy as an institutional structure was settled. But it's not. It's not. We have to choose a community over chaos. Are we the people who are going to choose love over hate? These are the vital questions of our time and the reason why I'm here as your president. I believe Dr. King's life and legacy show us the way and we should pay attention. I really do. <laughs> Dr. Martin Luther King was born in a nation where segregation was a tragic fact of life. He had every reason to believe, as others of the generation did, that history 
had already been written that the division would be America's destiny. But he rejected that outcome. He heard Micah's command to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. And so often, when people hear about Dr. King, people think of his ministry and the movement were most about the epic struggle for civil rights and voting rights. But we do well to remember that his mission was something even deeper. It was spiritual. It was moral. The goal of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which Dr. King led, stated it clearly and boldly, and it must be repeated again now, to redeem the soul of America. I'm not joking. To redeem the soul of America. What, what is the soul of America? It's easy to say, but what is the soul of America? Well, the soul is the breath, the life, the essence of who we are. The soul makes us us. The soul of America is embodied in the sacred proposition that we're all created equal in the image of God. That was the sacred proposition for which, for which Dr. King gave his life. It's a sacred proposition rooted in Scripture and enshrined in the Declaration of Independence. A sacred proposition he invoked on that day in 1963 when he told my generation about his dream, a dream in which we're all entitled to be treated with my father's favorite word, dignity and respect. A dream in which we all deserve liberty and justice, and it's still the task of our time to make that dream a reality because it's not there yet. <laughs> to make Dr. King's vision tangible, to match the words of the preachers and the poets with our deeds. As the Bible teaches us, we must be doers of the word, doers of the word. The battle for the soul of this nation is perennial. It's a constant struggle. It's a constant struggle between hope and fear, kindness and cruelty, justice and injustice against those who traffic in racism, extremism, and insurrection. A battle fought on battlefields and bridges from courthouses and ballot boxes to pulpits and protest. And at our best, the American promise wins out. At our best, we hear and heed the injunctions of the Lord and the whispers of the angels. But I don't need to tell you that we're not always at our best. We're fallible. We fail and fall. But faith and history teach us that, however dark the night, joy cometh in the morning. And that joy comes with the commandments of Scripture. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy mind, and all thy soul, and love thy neighbor as thyself. Easy to say, easy to say, but very hard to do. But in that commandment, in my view, lies the essence of the gospel and the essence of the American promise. It's when we see each other as neighbors and not enemies that progress and justice come. It's when we see each other as fellow human beings, as children of God, that we bend to begin to walk the path of Dr. King's beloved community. A path is dream-inspired, and his legacy propel us forward to this day. Here's what I learned in my life and my career along that path, as many of you have learned along your path. We're all imperfect beings, 
We don't know where and what fate will deliver to us and when. But we do, we can do our best to seek a life of light and hope and love and, yes, truth. Truth. That's what I try to do every day to build the future that we all want or reminding ourselves that nothing, nothing is guaranteed in our democracy. Nothing. Every generation is required to keep it, defend it, protect it, to be repairs of the breach. And to remember that the power to redeem the soul of America lies where it always has lie, lay, in the hands of we the people. We the people. I was vividly reminded of that truth on the South Lawn of the White House. I believe you were there, both of you, both your senators. On the South Lawn of the White House with our Vice President Kamala Harris and hearing these words, and I quote, it took just one generation from segregation to the Supreme Court of the United States, end of quote. Those are the words of Kajan, Kajan, Katanji Drown Jackson, our Supreme Court Justice. <laughs> took just one generation of segregation to the Supreme Court of the United States. As I told folks at the time, she's smarter than you are. As Dr. King said, give us the ballot and we will place judges on the bench who will do justly. <coughs> and we are. That's the promise of America, where change is hard but necessary. <coughs> Excuse me. Progress is never easy, but it's always possible. And the things do get better on our march toward a more perfect union. But at this inflection point, we know there's a lot of work that has to continue on economic justice, civil rights, voting rights, on protecting our democracy. And I'm remembering that our job is to redeem the soul of America. Look. I get accused of being an inveterate optimist. I call that the Irish of it. <laughs> we're never on top, always stepped on, but we are optimistic. Like Dr. King was optimistic. Folks, uh, as I said, progress is never easy. Redeeming the soul of the country is absolutely essential. I doubt whether any of us would have thought, even in Dr. King's time, that the, literally the institutional structures of this country might collapse. Like we're seeing in Brazil, we're seeing in other parts of the world. Folks, I'll close with this, with a blessing I see today. In the Oval Office, and many of you have been there, been there in my office. You get to set it up the way you want, within reason. As I sit at my desk, <laughs> as I sit at my desk and look at the fireplace, just to the left is the bust of Dr. King. It's there in that spot on purpose, because he was my inspiration as a kid. He does know where we should go. I ran for three reasons. I said I wanted to restore the soul of America. 
I wanted to rebuild this country from the bottom up and the middle out. And I wanted to unite it. And not far from him, if you look about 40, 50 degrees to the right, there is another statue, another bust of Rosa Parks. And people ask me, why? I say, and I put in my words, she just say, I've had enough. I've had enough. Folks, uh, I often think of the question that Dr. King asked us all those years ago. I think it's important you all remember, but I think it's important the nation remember it. He said, where do we go from here? That's a quote. Where do we go from here? Well, my message to the nation on this day is we go forward. We go together. When we choose democracy over autocracy, a beloved community over chaos, when we choose believers in the dreams, to be doers, to be unafraid, always keeping the faith. Every time I walk out of my Irish Catholic grandfather's home up in Scranton, Pennsylvania, his name was Ambrose Finnegan. And he'd yell, Joey, keep the faith. And my grandmother, no, Joey, spread it. <laughs> spread the faith. No, I'm serious. <laughs> this is a Catholic rosary I have on my wrist. One my son had on the day, night he was dying. The point is, there's hope. There's always hope. We have to believe. And ladies and gentlemen, that was Dr. King's path, in my view, the path to keeping the faith. And it must be our path. Folks, for God's sake, this is the United States of America. The United States, there's nothing beyond our capacity, nothing beyond our capacity if we set our mind to it. And ladies and gentlemen, we're a land of dreamers and a land of doers. Nothing's beyond our capacity. And the gospel song that Dr. King loved, as I understand, he always told he did, we've come too far from where we started. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. He did not go this far to leave me. My fellow Americans, I don't think the Lord brought us this far to leave us. I really don't. My word. And ladies, my fellow Americans, God bless Dr. Martin Luther King and his family. And based on his, one of his favorite hymns, precious Lord, take my hand through the storm, through the night, and lead me on to the light. May God bless you all, and let's go find the light. We can do this. Yeah.